Okay, we are we are ready to start. Uh, good <laughs> afternoon. It's uh, my special pleasure to welcome uh, Tom Harwood, uh, who just recently joined the Environmental Change Institute as the new associate director. Welcome again, officially. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Tom uh, is a is a similar quant as I am, but he actually. Uh, he is very specialized and quite an established figure in uh, uh, biodiversity research and one of those few ones who not only model everything from the micro to the global macro scale, uh, but he also truly understands what uh, what he's talking about because many of, uh, of us who do modeling not necessarily uh, do understand uh, what the because it's simplification of course, uh, what uh, what it means. Um, uh, Tom also uh, was part of many international networks and also had uh, quite significant uh, uh, policy impact. And one policy impact, I think, which is quite quiet, but super powerful is actually establishing indicators for international uh, treaties uh, or negotiations, which countries actually follow. And I think you are responsible for something like three of them uh, for the... Uh, biodiversity, UN Biodiversity Convention, mm -hmm. uh, but you also contributed to uh, the IPBF economic stuff, yeah. account uh, accounting uh, uh, part of uh, of biodiversity, and then uh, also contributed to IPBES or IPBES, it's called these days. Yeah, one, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. A different way of pronouncing it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Lovely, thank you, um, thank you, you so much. Your... I have my own okay. microphone. Yeah, thank you so much, Mikhail. Um, and uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, particularly those of, those of you who I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, the work that I've been doing really for the past 14 years. Um, you know, most of the maps I'm going to show are maps I produce personally, but you don't do these things without a wonderful team of um, lovely people, um, intelligent people to work with. A lot of this work is based on the sort of theories of Simon Ferrier, um, who sort of employed me when I went over to Australia. Um, and now I've come back. Um, I'm going to talk about habitat condition. I'm going to talk about biodiversity. I'd like you to put aside pre any conceptions you have of what those words mean and don't let your ideas of those get in the way of what I'm trying to say. There's only so many words in the English language and they get repurposed in a lot of ways. So some of these definitions, which are very precise quantitative definitions, may clash with the way you, you think about the world. Um, let's discuss that at the end. Uh, so how do I advance here? Let's try that one. So look, just to give an example of the type of thing we need to understand and the type of answers that we can provide. Uh, this is a map of Australia. A lot of my examples will be Australian. Uh, the gray areas are the relatively intact areas the colored areas are the cleared areas. And um, this is a map of you know, where you would prioritize um, to restore vegetation under multiple climate change scenarios for a climate robust restoration policy. So that's a kind of useful thing to be able to um, produce an answer to. Uh, something else that's useful to talk about is, you know, where have we come from and where are we now? So this is the historical degradation of Australia as illustrated by the gray bit here. And that's converted into a proportion of the species that are likely to be retained in the long term. So, you know, maybe 7% of species in Australia, according to the, our models, would be um, committed to extinction already from past land use change. And potentially you can restore that and bring that value up. Um, another important thing is what happens when you add climate change on top of that, you know, what's the impact of climate change on biodiversity? Note this is a broken axis. It's not, not, not the end, completely the end of the world, but there's a significant drop. This is a one Earth system model. This is another Earth system model. Um, and you know, we've got two extremes here. One is the current extent, the gray area. Um, one is what happens if we restore the whole of Australia? How far does that get us up? How, how what proportion of species does that enable us to retain? And basically it's much the same as that 7% we had at the top. You can get that 7% back, but climate change is pushing us a long way down and you know, threatening an awful lot of species. And note also that there's a big difference between the two uh, system models. This, you know, if you just look at temperature, those are quite similar, but the combinations of temperature and rainfall have quite dramatic effects when you consider them both at the same time for biodiversity. Okay, so that's the kind of problem and the sort of 
kind of answers that this is all meant to address. So first major point is area is not biodiversity. Biodiversity is not area. If you want to say biodiversity, you don't just protect area. There's a thing called what used to be called the species area law. Now it's called the species area relationship. It's a curve of this shape where here you have a sort of a complete amount of area. Here we have the smallest amount of area. This relationship holds true from you know, qu individual quadrats and ramping them up to whole regions where you're degrading those. And the proportion of original species that you get as a function of that original area is described by this power law, typically a, a Z of 0.25, a power relation to 0.25, which gives you a curve of this kind of shape. So in practice, if we've got an island in the middle of the sea, we start chopping away at it, start off, we've got quite a lot of species being preserved. We get down to say 40% of the island removed. We still have 80% of the species. We're not killing off all the species because there's still some space for some of those. But as we move further down, we plummet down and then we lose everything when we have no island. No, not that surprising. But um, on top of that, all area is not equal. So let's imagine a situation where we've got some mountaintops or some wetlands in our island, which have 50% of the species which are endemic to that island. And then you do the same thing and you remove it, take, it, take things away. And once you wipe out that bit of habitat, you're suddenly a lot, lot further down and uh, things are a lot more dramatic. And that's a really important consideration when trying to preserve things um, from a biodiversity perspective. So the tools we need to do this, I'm gonna start with um, a definition of habitat conditions. So do an awful lot of stuff um, in fact, all my work I'm going to present is based on a sort of raster-based system, you know, grid-based maps of the world or, or, or the area at different resolutions. Imagine this is a pixel of land, uh, this red thing, which is also kind of a bucket that you can put stuff in, put biodiversity in, you can put habitat condition. The important thing is how do we measure the importance of that bucket? How do we measure what that bucket can do? So let's imagine this is a native um, system under these architectural um, trees, but, you know, we can go there and we can, we can measure biodiversity because oh there's some lovely birds there and then we can go there again we find the birds are not there because the birds are not actually that you know part of the land they're just passing through and a lot of the species you get are actually a function of the surrounding landscape rather than the land parcel itself so just going and measuring stuff only gets you a small snapshot of what's going on at that particular time and could be really really misleading and it's obviously it's the basis of a lot a lot of assessments but it's not necessarily the best way to go about things or we can just imagine we've removed everything Got nothing there. We can, you know, put a car park in, and have no capacity to support biodiversity. We could put in a modified um, agricultural landscape, a slightly less modified agricultural landscape that still purport, um, supports a little bit of biodiversity. Or we can start restoring stuff, and get back to our original um, restored landscape. And you know, this is what we're talking about in terms of condition from the definition that I use. Important thing about this is it depends. The importance of that condition in that location depends on whether you're in a highly degraded landscape or whether you're in a really intact landscape. Um, context is absolutely everything here. Where you are on the species area curve is absolutely vital. So let's imagine we're in a really intact landscape and moving between the, the blue totally degraded point and the green totally restored point. We plot that on the, on the axis here. And this is the sort of effect of effective area of, of doing that manipulation. If you're in a really intact landscape, it has a very small effect on the total amount of species. But if you're in a same cell with the same range of actions in a highly degraded landscape, that's really important, has a much bigger effect on biodiversity. So you can't, can't ignore that, and it's really important. And also imagine that, you know, the, that the cell B is really in quite a good state, cell A is in quite a degraded state. You measure sort of what the implications are then for um, biodiversity, I can't see what's happening with my numbers here. It's not moving on at all. It's frozen. Okay. Sorry, we're all frozen here. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Pardon my, got carried away with my clicking probably there. Um, so cell A, which is in a pretty bad state, gets a biodiversity that's found in that location, is going to do really well. It's protected um, elsewhere because of the surrounding landscape. So it gets a high number. Stuff in cell B gets a really low number because everything's really stressed because you've wiped out everything else. 
So, you know, when it comes to things like biodiversity net gain and giving numbers and paying people for biodiversity, if you go there and you measure the stuff, you'll find that there's plenty of stuff in cell A and you give it loads of money, go to cell B, which is far more important, you give it less money because there's less stuff there. So you've got to be really, really careful that, to take all these things into account when you're doing stuff. So, you know, one of the ideas I had was to take that upper and lower limit for an individual property, rescale it to zero and one. That gives you a measure of where you stand relative to what you can actually do with your individual property. You can take the, uh, the state and you can measure it onto that zero to one scale. You can do the same for the other one, which gives a, a different, a lower scale. And then you get a whole range of numbers. And this one, you know, we see that B is actually doing much better given the capacity that B has. Um, you know, the control that the landholder has over their land, they're doing a better job than A, which was quite highly degraded. But all these numbers are important. You have to consider all these numbers in order to get a whole picture of what you're dealing with with biodiversity. And if you're not dealing with that, then you're not really dealing with biodiversity. Um, so, yeah, what is ha habitat condition? How do we measure it? Um, this is a bloke called Donald McDonald, who I met at the millennium. This is uh, taken like 40 years before the millennium. He was quite significantly older when I met him. He lived up near, lived up near Tarbot, in Tarbot Bay, which had three houses, nine miles north of Malague. You only get there by boat or by walking. Um, he said he chopped down a tree every day of his life for his whole life for firewood. I was a lovely bloke. But when we look at his surrounding landscape, we can see that he was fairly active and uh, his whole family were fairly active. And, you know, this is, you know, we don't, we talk about people living in harmony with nature and being really, really natural. People do a lot of damage in really low densities over, over time. There's not much grazing going on here. You can't blame it on the sheep. Um, although he did have a pet sheep. Um, uh, so, yeah, how do we how do we quantify condition in a meaningful way? We can be okay. We can say tarmac is is zero. Nothing can live there. We can have you know, really nice natural woodland. This is Horner woodland in Exmoor, and somewhere just over the horizon from that is this idealized, perfectly natural state, and a range of things in between. And we can kind of rank those relatively intuitively and get some arbitrary ordering. Arbitrary ordering isn't really enough. Um, and one of the things I've been doing an awful lot of is this rather complicated habitat condition assessment system, which uses distances between reference sites in, in remote sensing space and environmental space and models them on two-dimensional probability histograms, does all sorts of complicated stuff to give a distance from um, your individual test site from environmentally relevant, ecologically relevant uh, reference sites only gets you so far, and this bit at the top is a critical bit. How do you calibrate the distance you get at the end? You have a, how far does this, this site deviate from what we expect it to, measured in some arbitrary units. You then have to convert that to a sensible, meaningful measure of condition, which you can use to actually make biodiversity decisions and which is comparable across multiple landscapes. So you know, we've got this deviation from reference condition, we can put it over our, our ranking before. And the question is, how do you actually scale these bits in between. If you want to ask experts, which is a bit like, I mean, it's, it's, it's essentially meaningless to ask experts unless you know what question you're asking experts and the experts know what question they're answering. If you say, what is the condition of this? People will give you a number and they'll tend to cluster things down in this direction. If you ask a woodland expert, they'll probably be really harsh on different types of woodland, but they're still just making up a number about some stuff relative to an abstract concept which you haven't defined. So it's not actually a solution to estimating anything if you want to use it in a quantitative framework. It's just a, a shortcut to getting an answer which you can pretend you can use really complicated methods of doing it, but you're still just asking somebody a vague question and getting them to throw a dart on the board. And uh, you know, zero and one, well-defined, everything else in between, very poorly defined according to traditional uh, ways of operating. So when we think about how you would actually use condition. These are just a couple of examples from the literature. Um, and what we tend to use condition is as is a unit of area. So you know, on the left here in the Philippines, the grayed out areas are the areas that which have been cleared, they're not available anymore. So uh, we can look at what happens up to the remaining vegetation under climate change. Um, on the uh, right, this was an example of connectivity in the Atlantic forest using 
you know, a, a mosaic of intact and uh, removed forest. And then you can measure connectivity throughout that network to get some measure. But basically you're saying you can take any, all these different pixels and you can add them up and the sum of that area is meaningful. You're actually using the condition as area. And if you think of any example where habitat condition is used, it's always used as a measure of area, which means magically that if habitat condition is area, we can take this species area curve and we can flip it around using the magic of flipping around in us. And we can say that condition is a function of the proportion of species that you get a location at, at a location. So if you can do a proper um, meta-analysis of the effect of different land use types on condition, you can then take that value. So what proportion of original species do we get in agricultural landscapes generally? We can run that back through the species area curve and get a, a point estimate of condition. And it just so happens that it's um, predicts meta-analysis being done at the Natural History Museum. Um, there's another couple of other um, meta-analysis has been done, but the predicts one is, is the largest and most rigorous one to date, where they look at proportion of species in, in um, native vegetation and the proportion of species um, in paired studies right, right across the world in different um, land use types. So, you know, for our global indicators, um, we need a global map of habitat condition, which didn't exist before we started. Generally, with, when you try and do anything, you find that what you need doesn't exist. Um, so we took the land use harmonization data set, which is 12 land use classes, which underpin from 1500 to 2100. It's a you know, generally agreed on time series, which is used in a lot of the IPCC assessments. Um, some remote sense data, the original stuff with the um, MODIS vegetation continuous field data. You can sort of model regional models, the land use as a function of this vegetation and uh, bring in some contextual data, distance to nearest habitation, climatic data, and so on and so forth. And that allows you to downscale this original data set to a uh, fine scale. So this is uh, 30 seconds, one kilometer resolution, global proportion of each of these 12 land use classes per pixel. Given that, bring in the predicts data set, um, uh, for each of the, which give, can give you a number for each of these 12 land use classes, run it through the species area curve, and that gives you a habitat condition surface. Now it's slightly more complicated than that. You have to take into account the age of secondary vegetation as a continuous map, and the definitions of you know, pasture and rangelands are really variable globally. So you have to take into account um, uh, grazing density. So you know, use the wooded livestock of the world and sort of back calculated and remodeled. This is a condition of uh, land within grazed vegetation. A lot of these places are actually have no grazing, which is why they're not, um, they don't actually count. So it's just a map of, you know, only, it's only relevant for the pixels within that, which are actually grazed. But you can look at the numbers here. You know, if you look at urban, urban system, you get basically 70% of native species in an urban system. So that's not a measure of condition. If you use it directly, it's quite bizarre. And it's not really what you expect. A lot of that's to do with the fact you've got surrounding landscape and you've got habitat in, 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 you know, remnant habitat in urban system. But when you run it through the species area relationship, it gets down to about 0.2, which actually fits with what happens if you ask experts that random question um, about what they think about the thing that they haven't actually defined and you haven't defined um, that they might think is a good idea to talk about. Um, that allows us to get you know, a beautiful map of global habitat condition. Uh, when you look at this, so at the macro scale, this looks really similar to the um, human footprint index. When you zoom in, it looks um, much nicer. Um, because it's a time series based on remote sensing and we can do a certain amount of um, post-processing to prevent nonsensical transitions like things suddenly becoming primary untouched vegetation after being cleared. We can develop a time series and this shows the long-term 20-year you know, trend in habitat condition according to this method of measuring it. It's just one method of measuring it. A lot of the habitat loss across the north, particularly at, look up in Russia there, that's actually fire. Um, and whether or not fire should be included in a, a measure of habitat condition is really quite debatable. So, you know, probably, you know, I, in an ideal world, if fire is natural, then you want to um, exclude it from habitat condition. If fire is a result of anthropogenic climate change, then you probably want to include it as an anthropogenic impact as your measure of um, habitat condition. So fire gets really, really complicated and 
know, so some of this may or may not be uh, quite right. This is all pretty much uh, genuine deforestation. Um, uh, uh, some of this this restoration is, is actually going on um, in, in the Atlantic forests. So quite happy with that as a map, but you know, it's it's just one one version of truth that you can easily take apart. Given a map of habitat condition, you can start to move on to measures of connectedness. And I'm talking about connectedness as opposed to connectivity, because connectivity tends to mean, you know, how well connected are two patches of the landscape. Connectedness I'm talking about as a property of the individual location, how well connected is that location connected to the stuff it needs to be connected to. So you can overlay a, a, a you know, radial grid like this over the landscape. And for each of these cells, you can calculate you know, the value of this cell to this central cell can be estimated based, based on the sort of con average condition state or some condition state for that area. You can calculate the least cost path to that to give you a, a, um, a cost of getting there. So you have a cost and a benefit. You can do a basic cost and benefit analysis and say what before, how well connected is this cell to the surrounding landscape relative to the way it would be connected to um, on, on, in an intact landscape. And do that for multiple dispersal distances, typically used two kilometers, 20 kilometers, 200 kilometers, um, and um, 2,000 kilometers. I may have missed out 10 there, I'm not quite sure, four stages, which is 10 times <laughs> larger than each other. Um, we can then, uh, yeah, we use this for our protected area connectedness index, which takes the world database for protected areas, says, you know, where, where are the um, protected areas, how well connected are they? to other protected areas and to primary intact vegetation. Uh, it tells you a fairly simple story. Uh, small fragmented uh, protected areas in the north aren't particularly well connected. Large uh, <laughs> protected areas in the south are quite well connected. So you could probably uh, color that, that map in by hand without doing all the maths, but it's um, you know a useful, useful thing to have and the CBD quite like it. So, that's condition, that's the, the state of the individual cells, the individual pixels that you have and how well connected they are. Valuing, again, you know, it's rather conflicting to that initial statement that biodiversity area is not biodiversity, valuing stuff purely based on the area, effective area of habitat that you have. Um, so if we bring in biodiversity, first thing I want to address is uh, the spatial resolution. You know, within Australia, we do stuff at 250, 90 meter resolution for the continent. Um, globally, currently restricted to one kilometer maximum resolution. But when we started this work, typically the finest resolution you had was sort of 30 kilometers. And here's some 30 kilometer grid sales laid over Mexico City. Uh, you can see the protected areas are the sort of orangey areas. Um, and you can see that they're all skewed to the top of the mountains where the land isn't actually useful for building cities or for agriculture. And this is a typical situation. Um, it means you're protecting the stuff that lives on the top of the mountains and the stuff which is down in the valleys, you're just wiping it out. And so if you take, don't take that into account, you can get some quite positive measures of how well you're protecting stuff whilst at the same time pushing species to extinction. If you look at a finer resolution, it's a one kilometer grid over the same uh, area, you can actually take into account the differences in protection um, and uh, biodiversity and degradation of biodiversity in the different parts of the landscape. The definition of the biodiversity um, we use, I mean, it's fairly, this is all fairly standard. And gamma diversity is basically how much stuff you have over really large areas. Alpha diversity is the species of richness. You go to a location, measure how many species there are, how, you know, um, and beta diversity is the heterogeneity of the landscape, you know, two measures. Of that there's a sort of whole of landscape scale heterogeneity in this pairwise um, beta diversity between two locations, how different are two locations to each other. So, you know, for species richness, you can go to a location, you can say, oh, how many species are there at the location? Go to a slightly warmer location, how many species are there there? How many species are there in a warmer and wetter location? And you can develop a model like that, which will tell you that if you go to rainforest, you'll find more species than you will if you're at the Arc in the Arctic. Um, I'm not saying that to dismiss the, the value of this modeling, but that, that's what it will tend, that, that's what, what you will tend to get out of it uh, when you do it. Um, what we typically worked with is pairwise beta diversity. Um, this is Sorensen or Bray Curtis dissimilarity index, which says you know, how different are the species that pair a site. 
fairly simple measure in you know, how many species do they have in common, how many are unique to each site, shove it into the magic equation and get a number between zero and one, which tells you how dissimilar or how similar those two locations are. And then you can model that pairwise dissimilarity for multiple pairs of locations, you know, millions of pairs of locations um, as a function of the same distances in environmental space. So how different is the environment for multiple environmental variables? Do it all at once, get a measure of multidimensional environmental effect on this species compositional um, similarity. And this is an example for Tasmania, a fairly simple model. Um, and this is what the model looks like in the middle. The effect on species is the y-axis, the variables themselves are on the x-axis. And to take a simple example, precipitation, uh, if, in a, at the dry end down here, uh, you add a little bit of water, uh, it'll have quite a big effect on the species composition. When you get to the really wet parts, you add the same amount of water, it doesn't actually have very much on, uh, effect on species composition. And bear in mind, this is in Tasmania, which is actually a pretty wet spot. Um, you can take those functions though and take the original variables and transform them from their original units of, you know, millimeters of water, degrees centigrade and so on into units of ecological distance. So they're all measured in the same units. What is the effect of, the, of change in these variables on the ecological, um, uh, on, on the ecology? And this is really where, you know, most of my work has come in when someone else has done that hard bit. Um, and actually you can take a stack of grids and you can say for any two locations, you can look at within each, each of these layers, say what's the absolute difference between these two locations. You can sum it all up, run it through a quick transformation, and it gets you back to the dissimilarity measure. So you can say how similar or dissimilar is the ecological composition of any two locations on this grid. That means that for each location, here's a test cell in the middle, you can say how similar is that to that cell in the corner and color it by how green it is. We can do that for all the other grid cells. And um, we have a scientific term for the, what we end up with here, which is the green blob map, which tells you how, how similar the, that location is, where the similar stuff in the landscape is found. Typically, it's fairly uh, geographically proximal. Um, and this is where I lived before in the ACT, just before I came here. This is a map of the similarity of a nature reserve in the north there. Um, where shades of green show how where the more similar stuff is. And once it gets white, it's not, you know, won't find many species in common. In these yellowy areas, you might have 30 or 40% species in common. They may be the structural dramatic species that you really notice. They may be the species which are sort of understory, rarer species. The great advantage of this approach is you can put all the species in, count all the species equally. So you're not just looking at the well-studied or threatened species, which really skews your view of the world. You're looking at all species, looking at biodiversity, as opposed to some anthropogenically filtered concept of what you should be prioritizing. So it's, it's really useful when you put it alongside that, you know, um, more focused species level uh, approach. You know, they're, they're complementary approaches um, in the same way that bringing values into these decisions is complementary. It doesn't mean that, you know, just because we have one method, it's the right way to do things. So we can take all, all that green blob and we can sort of say, what's the total area of that? We can store that value for the grid, each grid cell. Um, so, you know, within an intact landscape, here's a little grid cell in the middle. This is, we do, can do, do this for every single grid cell that we want to process. And we say for that grid cell, where's its green blob? What proportion of that green blob, say, sits within the protected area system? Or what proportion of the green blob is left when you take habitat condition into account? And then you can, you know, do, as we always do, take that proportion, run it back through the species area curve and say, for that little blue cell in the middle, what proportion of the species similar to that are going to persist in the long term, given this current test state that we're wanting to test. And um, I built this into a sort of global bilby system, which enables us to churn out um, biodiversity indicators. So yeah, we've got three um, indicators now, which currently, you know, we're Aichi target indicators, and now they're um, CBD, you know, global biodiversity framework indicators, which are used um, for global reporting. So the type of things we can do, we can do past to present analyses. So our representativeness of protected areas index, index um, says how well represented is each grid cell in the protected area um, network. So protected area network here in black, green areas better, better represented 
brown areas not so well represented. Um, the stuff which is in similar environments to the protected areas is quite well represented. Um, and you know, some of these areas here, in, in probably you know, mountain tops here, in, in the similar areas are actually quite well protected because the species which they have are protected elsewhere. So you need to allow things to be protected in protected areas which you also share. But in the lowland areas, the more modified areas and, the, you know, and just the, the more generally lowland areas, you've got a big skew and you've got stuff which isn't protected. Um, so you're taking this fine scale stuff, you can summarize that by um, nation or you can do histograms within nations. And here I've put the uh, IHE target of 17% uh, protection, which most countries think they met. Uh, as you see, most countries didn't actually meet it if you actually take um, heterogeneity of a species into account and the new 30% uh, uh, protection target over here. Now, these are targets which are based on the aerial definition of stuff. So they're probably, you know, judging them by doing, actually taking biodiversity into account is probably a bit harsh. And uh, it's probably why um, this indicator isn't, hasn't moved forward into the, uh, into the new framework because people don't want to know that they're not gonna do it. They want to know they can do it just by protecting all the mountaintops um, and the convenient areas and to hell with all the species that are actually going extinct. But um, taking a more positive um, view, uh, we've had a wonderful trend uh, over, over, over time since the time series, 1917, 1990, 2010, 2020. And we could see that, you know, even at that 30% level anywhere, which is green here, all those areas are already, you know, meeting that um, 2050 target. And um, they're quite well, well protected. And there was a bit of a skew to where the reserves actually are and to where humans actually don't really want the land. Um, and going beyond that is actually really complicated because people do actually need land to do stuff and there will always be a skew of land use, which means that more species are gonna be threatened than we'd like to pretend. And we can actually combine that with our protectedness in index. So rather than you know, treat every grid cell as if it's protected area, as if it's equal, we can say, we can weight it by the, the protected, the connectedness. And this is something I should be doing this year. We can take that raw condition score and we can develop a measure of connected condition. This involves a slightly more complex regional species area um, thing, uh, scaling that I developed. But um, this is the area around Bangkok. It shows basically how well connected it is in the same, on, on the same units. And we can take that um, uh, uh, measure and, and use that in, in the, what we call our global um, our biodiversity habitat index. Um, which is a measure of basically the, the um, extent to which um, you know, the proportion of species is, is dropping down. So this measures the proportion of species um, which are, are threatened by extinction. This is the map that gave that one million figure for the Living Planet Report. There's two things, the predicts database and this one. That's where, where that, that comes from. Um, and you know, a lot, I love this map. I think it's a really, really, really nice um, map. What it does show is that you... You know, just because you degrade one area, it doesn't mean that everything has to be doomed if you can look after other stuff. Uh, this same approach um, can be used when used in the UN Sierra ecosystem accounts. Um, you can use the condition stuff to do condition accounts, the biodiversity approaches to do biodiversity accounts. This is an example for the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia. Um, but the first demonstration of this, when it was still the um, experimental ecosystem account, did this lovely piece of work um, for the San Martin region in Peru uh, with Conservation International. And they worked with, with local people to come up with different condition maps for, for plants and for invertebrates and for vertebrates. So with, verte invert with vertebrates, it takes into account bushmeat hunting in, 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 the, uh, in the local area. We were able to do past to present land use change, map that like we did in the first thing, and then look at what happens under different land use change scenarios when you bring climate change in. So showing that you can not only produce a, a measure you know, for accounting, but you can project what that measure, what the implications of that is going to be into the future, which is a really important thing here. We have to take climate change into account if we want to really move forward, because it actually you know, gets spatial distributions move around a lot um, under climate change. So if we bring in climate change, you know, with this framework, the wonderful thing about it is you can take your present stuff and you can transform it using the model. You can take the equivalent projected future grids and transform those using the same model. And then you can have two stacks of grids and you can do calculations between those. So you can take a cell I and cell J. It's actually the same cell in this case. You can do exactly the same calculation. You can say, 
how similar will I expect these two cells across space and time to be to each other based on their environmental conditions. Uh, so it assumes the space for time substitution is valid, been shown using pollen data that it is valid over really, really long time scales. Um, but you know, over shorter time scales, there's all sorts of other processes coming into play. You know, species are adapting, species are persisting in places where they're not going to last for long. Um, uh, species are getting stuck in places, not being able to adapt in the way that you would expect them to. Uh, lots of other factors coming in. This is just part of the picture, but it's quite a useful part of the picture because it enables you to say, uh, ask some interesting questions. So this is a southern hemisphere example. So, you know, where is the similar stuff? Where's the green blob for that stuff under, under future conditions? Moves towards the pole um, in the south uh, and uh, becomes paler than it was before. This is a very consistent trend. You get less similar stuff in the future because climate is changing and it's changing in a directional way. And unless you're in a really special location where there's lots of similar stuff, that's probably a bad, bad thing. And then you can do the same calculations with your future test area under future climates and uh, protected area scenarios, future condition scenarios, and calculate the proportion of species that you're going to get um, persisting in the long term. So, and a few really simple, interesting measures, and you know, these are perhaps more interesting in when you think about what they mean for the way you think about climate change affecting biodiversity than they necessarily are in their own right. So you can say how much is how much change are you going to get at the location? What's the difference between the current state and the future state of a location? What's the pressure, ecological pressure, that's going to be on that particular location um, when you put climate change into the picture? You can look from the present into the future and you can say, what's the most similar location I can find in the future to my current state at this location? And a little diagram here, you've got the point change here, the future state is the blue line and the current state you know, over, over one dimensional space. And get a measure of disappearingness for how, how, how similar your grid cell, you know, the greenest part of the top map is really to your, um, to your cell. And that's quite a useful measure. You can also invert that, say, looking at the future state back to the present. How similar is the future state of this location going to be to anything you can imagine anything you can observe in the future, in the, in the current um, world. And to give a sort of put that into proportion, look at past to present change. This is looking for sort of 20 year average climates for Australia, um, sort of 2017 center climate, looking back to each decade, back to sort of 1947 to 67 period, and you get a measure of how novel the climate is, you know, how unique that current climate is essentially to the past. And you get a measure of about 0.4, in some of these really extreme uh, places where there's quite a lot of change in the sort of multi-dimensional climate spaces, so taking into account the temperature, evaporation, rainfall, uh, soil conditions, all, all, all these important ecological factors, but how you know, obviously soil conditions are not changing in, in our models because they're hard enough to estimate anyway, they should um, in the long term, uh, but that's a really complicated uh, thing to bring into, a, into play. Take, bearing in mind that you know, most of this map is, is kind of sitting around point Point one, point two, and then we can look at you know what kind of results you actually get when you project into the future. And this we, we first started off doing work projecting to twenty seventy, but since pulled it back to twenty fifty because twenty seventy is just a bit on the mind blowing side. And when it comes to the amount of change that the models predict, pre predict. and these are conservative estimates of, of the change. So you've got your whole whole trend of change over the whole uh, range of the variable. You know if it goes up at the end you take the average uh, trend across for that variable across the whole time. If it flattens out at the end, you use the flattened out version. So you take the minimum amount of extrapolation when you move into unknown space. It's still you're extrapolating into unknown space. And maybe maybe that's a fantastic thing. Maybe when you boil plants, they're, they're really happy. Um, we can look here, what disappearing stuff on the left, novel stuff on the right. Red is bad, blue is, is not so bad. Uh, what we can see here, we've got a situation where got in the Gulf of Carpentaria, just south of there, stuff is disappearing. I'm not gonna see anything like that. And it's being replaced by stuff which has no analog anywhere in the continent of Australia. And like seriously, no analog, like 80, 90% species compositionally dissimilar from anything that you see in Australia. 
Um, so who knows what's going to happen there? Um, you know, who knows what species might end up there? What, are there a species which will persist? Some of these areas, we're actually talking protein denaturing by 2070. So probably nothing there. There's not much there to start off with. So that's part of the problem. Um, you also see here these, these little orange spots are mountaintops. So the mountaintop environments are disappearing. Stuff which is living on the mountains is, is going to be stuffed in the future. But they're surrounded by blue stuff, you know, places where stuff is not disappearing. And that's because when you look across onto the novel areas here, those mountaintops are blue. So they are providing climate refugia for the stuff which is down below them. So the mountaintops are really valuable. So it's one way of identifying climate refugia and places to which you... So putting the protected areas on top of the mountains, which I've been slagging off a bit, is actually a really good thing because those are the places that are going to be cool. Um, another way of looking at this globally, this is summarized by eco-region, is we've got novel on one axis and disappearing on, the, on, on another. The red areas are those, you know, areas which are both novel and disappearing. Uh, and uh, we can sort of color it and start thinking about what this means uh, for different eco-regions across the world. Um, and you can look at that by country level. Um, and you can see that basically if you're a climate denying country, you're stuffed. Um, so, you know, manage your politics and you'll probably be okay going into the future. Um, you may be familiar with the velocity of climate change measure. Um, there was a, a science paper came out um, about uh, 2009, I think it was. Uh, it was an interesting concept. Um, I looked you know, for individual climate variables. What's the slope um, at a particular location? Uh, and if you then project that slope going into the future to uh, track climate change, how far and how fast you actually have to travel in order to track climate change. It's actually quite a flawed measure. Um, the guy who invented it doesn't do that anymore. Because um, if you've got a really flat area, or imagine a completely flat area, you want to track, track the tiniest amount of change, you have to go infinitely fast. If you're right next to a mountain range, you could just go up, but you're actually a relatively flat area. There's no sense you can just go up a mountain. So it's really, really sensitive to scale and uh, resolution. And also doesn't take into account the amount of change, that point change, how much do you actually need to move? You don't need to move. It doesn't matter how fast you would need to move to track change, but if you're within your climatic envelope and just stay where you are. So that bring that into it is really important. So this is a measure I put together, which takes all those things into account and it's kind of a bit of a velocity of climate change concept, ends up being a, an index of how much, how, how effective local natural migration would be for a particular location. So you've got uh, how much change do you have at the location. Um, a here is how much benefit you get to going to the most similar cell that you can find. D is how far you have to travel to get there. And then you can, you can sort of triangulate this and measure the angle that you need to go. So if you've got you have to go um, a, a long way for not much change, you get a low angle. If you have to go a short way for a lot of benefit, you get a high angle. Um, and you can map that globally, which is, I produced this map just last week or the week before last, I love this. Um, the blue areas here are the places where uh, it's a good idea for species to migrate under climate change. They will get benefit. They will be, get adaptive um, capacity and they will be better off. So these are areas where you really want to enhance um, connectivity and you know, support the natural system. These are not places where you need to pick up species and move them. This is places where there is a great potential for things naturally to adapt. You know, those areas which are paler, um, then you probably need to find another solution to those. And uh, yeah, sort of here's a little zoom in uh, showing that the patterns are you know, quite interesting. Obviously, the Andes are a good adaptive place because uh, you can go uphill. Um, without because they're nice and steep. But something else to think about is the orientation of habitat. And this is some of my great unpublished work, um, mainly because it just raises questions about what the hell we should do about um, direction of habitat. So we've got our green blob, we can overlay a radial grid. We can say, you know, what's, what, what, what's the general alignment of that, of that um, location? And, we can measure that in terms of its uh, the actual 
angular direction and the vector here is the strength of that that uh, that directionality. So if it's all uniform, we haven't got much directionality. Um, this is work we did uh, ages and ages ago um, to try and get some money off um, the government for national national connectivity um, analysis. National corridors initiative. Um, you can see this is the alignment of, of habitat. So tends to be aligned around the coast, not surprisingly, things, you know, get coastal habitats and similar habitats found around the coast, and there's generally a strong latitudinal uh, uh, trend for similar habitat. And this is all very dependent on, on the radius you look at it, this is for a 200 kilometer radius. If you look at smaller radii or larger radii, it has different effects. If you bring climate change in, and you consider all those things, you get a map like this. So the white areas are those where there's not really a strong directional um, element. The greeny yellow areas are where local connectivity, local directionality is really important. So these are the areas where there's mountains along the east coast there. And the purple areas are those where large scale directional connectivity is really significant. And then you can see the direction of those uh, connectivity uh, patterns over time. And you can see the reason we didn't get any money for this is because when you overlay the natural national corridors initiative, you find that you know, some of the small scale initiatives around the coast come up really well, uh, but not surprising the Trans-Australian Eco Corridor, which context, um, connects temperate forest, rural desert to tropical conditions. Not many species are wanting to make that migration. Um, uh, and the Gondwana link here, which is a nice idea, doesn't, doesn't come up particularly, particularly strongly. Anyway, that didn't get us any money. Um, can also look at directionality. Uh, so rather than looking both directions at the orientation, if you're at this location, you want to go towards similar habitat, which direction do you need to go into? Um, so again, you can measure that as a direction and a vector, which is exactly what you need for wind field modeling. Uh, so how do I play this? Uh, I don't know, maybe I can play this by, nope, I can't play it that way, uh, mouse. A mouse play. I'm there. Thank you, Steve. And we can we can do these wonderful squirrely animations. Uh, so this is actually a habitat condition map. So the gray areas here are the degraded um, places, and the, the green areas are the intact places. You can see where stuff would go if it was tracking uh, tracking stuff. You can see that things move fairly short distances in degraded areas because it's not so easy to move across the landscape. If they can get out, they will try and try and get out. And um, I just put this up because it's pretty rather than because it's particularly informative um uh, oh no let's get away from that and no the next next okay uh can also uh looking at that that's there's 20 year time slots for the historical climate of australia you can say okay look if we knew what we were doing if plants and animals had agency and they could go where they needed to go to track their most similar habitat where would they be going? And this is sort of you know, a loop of time. And you can see that even if you know where you want to go, where you want to go, you know, this decade or the next decade, you might need to go back where you came from. And you could actually end up going around in circles in a lot of areas. Some places are quite stable, um, but some places are, 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 are tracking. And this is with just, you know, rather slow, calm climate change that we've experienced over the past, um, or just climate variation that we've experienced over the past century. So, you know, when you start thinking about how you're going to adapt to climate change, where you want to go, what way, where you want to put stuff in place, it's a really, really complicated business. You've got to take in, into account uh, you know, time uh, properly. So, oh, I to, I've realized what I'm doing. I'm pressing the wrong button. Um, so this brings on to my sort of last, last indicator, berry indicator, which puts everything, all, all these concepts in together, uh, connectivity and, and deals with connectivity to similar habitat. Um, so your benefit is based on how much of the green blob you have and what condition that green blob is in a particular one of these grid cells. Um, your least cost path is determined by the current landscape configuration. And then you can do that under multiple climate scenarios. So here in, a, in this future scenario, the benefit of this is determined by the um, you know, the condition and the uh, amount of greenness in your in your green blob. And you can say, well, how does that compare with what you get under current conditions um, uh, in an intact landscape? Uh, so the you know 
demonstrated this initially with uh, the global forest cover. There's a nice data set in Borneo. That's what the global forest cover looks like. Uh, we can say, okay, what's the connectivity under, of that under climate change, uh, under current climate? Get this nice, how well connected are you to similar ecological environments map? We can assume it's all intact and look at just the pure climate change effect. You know, where, where, where is climate change you know, most having the most impact and where are you well buffered the climate change? Again, a similar story down at the bottom of the mountains. You're probably going to be quite well connected to future habitat, future stuff similar to you because you've got hills, top of the mountains and stuff, large flat areas and stuff. Um, and then you can put it all together, get a single, single measure. You could see, well, the areas of high, high change, which are relatively flat and relatively cleared, come up quite badly. Uh, some of the mountain areas, even though there's quite high uh, uh, climate change because they're well, well, you know, fairly intact, they don't come out, out, out as badly as they might do. And you can use this, this basically tells you, you know, how well is the landscape set up for adaptive movement of species under climate change, provided they know where they want to go. But we ignore that part. I've just demonstrated it's really complicated, uh, assuming a particular future scenario. And we can do this under multiple climate scenarios. So we typically do it for you know three Earth system models and four RCPs um, within within one of those to get a range of different um, uh, possibilities. We can summarize that within um, any unit we want within eco regions. Um, so yeah, just go go back to that sort of Bangkok example. This is a typical kind of pattern. We've got a condition, uh, our connectedness to similar habitats, and then uh, you know, what 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 the in the berry index looks like into the future. And that's, you know, piles climate change on top of things and, you know, it tends to lower things. Looking at those indicators again, and here's our basic habitat condition. Here's the biodiversity habitat index, you know, the effect of that habitat condition on, on the current climate. And then, you know, what's the um, combined effect of land use and climate change on, on each grid cell. You know, where, and this, this highlights the areas where, you know, human, it, the combination of climate change and human interaction is limiting the species to uh, the ability of the species that are at those locations to adapt into the future. And it's quite a grim picture because, uh, you know, condition gets counted twice. You've got your initial degradation and then you've got the effect of condition limiting the movement of species across the landscape. So it's kind of effectively condition squared. So the fact and before you even take climate change into account kind of comes up as condition squared and then climate change knocks off you know 30 percent of your species and takes it down a bit further so coming back to our first slide um what can you do about this um you can run an integrated assessment model to plan for the future um here we've got two uh scenarios here low investment scenario in you know uh in carbon and uh, carbon environmentally friendly carbon options and a higher investment, more incentives for plantings. The only available land for doing this stuff, of course, is the uncleared stuff. Um, so you can see, you know, in this example here, you've got a lot of carbon plantings because there's no particular incentive for a biodiversity market. You get more green stuff, uh, you know, environmentally friendly carbon plantings if you invest. And then you can see the skew of the benefits here. The more purple it is, the more benefits you get, you can't really get much benefit outside the areas which are, uh, um, you can actually restore, you can see some, some trends here where, where the species are shared between these inland areas and the degraded areas, and if you invest in those, then you can get benefits. The maximum benefits here are in the areas of dark purple, so you can have really quite significant, maybe up 16 to 28% um, impact on the biodiversity in individual locations. Um, so there's, you know, there's quite a lot you can actually do. Uh, we can look at sort of how that plays out. This is a 16% uh, line in purple, uh, shows you how much benefit you can recover against this nasty trend of climate change. You're still left with the pink line for the stuff you can't really recover and then the existing uh, uh, effect of committed biodiversity on top of that. So, uh, but they're, 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 you can certainly really achieve quite significant um, effects on, 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 in some of those more degraded parts of the landscape and we should be doing that, so yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, I...
Thank you, Tom. Uh, I don't know whether you share my experience. This was an exponential talk. <laughs> it started, started out, you know, easy to follow. And uh, yes, I got this. I know this and so forth. And then it just went, whoa, <laughs> uh, uh, quite complicated and, uh, and really, but very, very insightful. Um, uh, do you have some immediate clarifying questions or shall we go into uh, some general discussion? Let's yeah. do clarifying first and then, then yeah. general, yeah? Uh, wait, you need to have this because otherwise people won't uh, hear it online. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering when you showed um, um, the similarity uh, metric, you showed that uh, first the difference between the current state and the future state, and then uh, the reverse, the difference between the future state and the current state. Um, and uh, I, so why were those not symmetric? Because I... So I, symmetric so I showed you three things. I showed you the point change for one point looking to the same point in the future, which is, as you point out, symmetrical, whichever way you do it, it's still the same distance. And then the other one is looking from the, the disappearing metric is looking from the current state to the most similar location you can find in the future landscape, environmental landscape, which is not the same as looking from the future state to the current state and saying how similar that is. So the novel and disappearing are different, but as you, as you point out, yeah, the point change is totally symmetrical. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for the talk. And uh, I don't know if this is a general question or, or, or <laughs> just a clarification, but when you talked about how different plots of land are connected and how similar species are in different plots of land, I was just wondering how do you and you, I might have missed this, but how do you measure um, the different species, different plots of land? Is it happening on the ground or, or how does that? Happen this together? is all, all, all using this, the same measure of dissimilarity. So for any, any, any grid cell, you can say how similar the, so starting on your central grid, so we know what, what's going on there. And you need to know what species composition is, but you can say how similar it is to any other location. So when you're looking in that wider landscape, you can measure that similarity based on that, 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 that model of beta diversity, which models how similar right. it is as a function of environment. So right. doesn't, you don't need to know what species are there. I mean, there's another crazy bit of work we do, which takes richness modeling and puts in, and the beta diversity modeling and puts in um, individual species records and you can juggle it all around and you can actually work out which species are in it every, every pixel. Um, and it actually works for sort of species distribution modeling of the entire uh, community. And then you can project that through climate change and move species around, track climate change. But yeah, that's that's just a bit too complicated to explain to anybody and a bit too complicated <laughs> to model unless you've got lots of time. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thanks. I was wondering where the, the actual species and biodiversity data comes from, because I was quite struck when you said that because you're looking at the complete biodiversity, it's not skewed by human you know, preference for maybe big furry things. But depending where that data comes from, I just wonder if, you know, sort of like microbial diversity, invertebrate diversity, how representative it is across taxa. Yeah, comes. look, so that's a really, 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 really good question. Um, we do it by particular biological groups. So for some of those initial things like disappearing and novel stuff, we did it for vascular plants in Australia. We did it for land snails in Australia. We did it for birds and mammals in Australia. And we did it for um, ground spiders in Australia, which produced a very peculiar map that I'm never going to show to anybody. Um, uh, and taking for those whole, whole biological groups and for the global stuff, we do have a model for plants, a model for invertebrates and a model for vertebrates. Uh, the biological data, say for the global stuff, with a, a dump of the whole GBIF database, and um, that was filtered out for non-native species and for dolphins in the middle of the desert and all that type of stuff. So a lot of lot of filtering involved there. But basically everything that was valid went in. So even if there was only one record for a species, that goes in because there's only one record for that species. So as far as we know, that's found in a unique location. And then they were aggregated to grid cells, and those grid cells, which were, you know, had enough species records to 
represent a sensible, you know, some kind of richness threshold. There's you know, a bit of jiggery pokery going on to chuck out stuff where you, you know, it's just one person's gone to one location and measured one thing. But for the uh, global modeling, because of that, um, uh, Simon Ferry and Andrew Hoskins developed a variation on the method, which actually uses individual observations. So it says, what's the probability of selecting two observations at random? And uh, uh, and then being a species match or a mismatch, and then modeling everything based off that. So Australia, we've got fairly good biodiversity data. Again, it's really skewed to you know the roads. There's large parts of Australia we don't have have data for. So there's lots of other you know biases in the data, even though you know do, do your best. Global data is a lot lot sparser, so you have to you know, have to take that extra step of rather than aggregating stuff to get a measure of what's going on at the site, which ideally you have you know full comprehensive plot data for. Um, you know, they're able to work with individual records. And that since has been uh, taken on work I had nothing to do with, um, but you can apply that over time to photographic citizen science records and then develop models, which are temp spatial temporal models of biodiversity based on individual um, observation pairs. Yeah. Thank you. I also have uh, one other question, which might uh, be a little too detailed, but still, um, in in cr crop scientists find that once uh, you have uh, species uh, traveling from uh, south to north uh, in the northern hemisphere or, or vice versa uh, in the southern hemisphere, that uh, the light regime changes and that many of those uh, uh, plant species cannot properly adapt to the to the new light regime and uh, probably you know many of these uh, forest species might actually not be able to travel north south simply because of, uh, of of changes in light regime is this uh, also somehow taken no uh, it's not it should be I, I i i've developed layers of civil twilight um to address exactly that. So photo period, what's the actual mm -hmm. meaningful photo period at different things and trying to model. Problem there is that uh, the temperature signal is so strongly correlated with the photo period signal, it's really hard to separate the two from each other. So, you, you know, the civil twilight basically is how much radiation you get over the course of the day, which is how warm it is and therefore what the temperature is. Um, so yeah, it just falls out of the models. It should be in there, totally agree. It's, uh, it's a passion of mine because I used to work on photo period in crops. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, but it's not it's not there. So, yeah. Can I ask about humans? Um, I, I was thinking that if we're projecting to 2050, if one was modeling the what happens to human beings, as in a lot of them probably going to die and they're probably all going to be crowding onto the top of those mountains. Does that have a material impact on what happens to the biodiversity? So there's a change in human behavior. Those who've been talking to me over the past few weeks, I know that's um, something again is bothering me. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I, that, I think that that pressure, particularly the pressure for agriculture to, to to move up the mountains into the areas which are currently intact in order to adapt agriculture, I think it's really important. Um, not getting that information from the agricultural models at the moment, and I, I think that's um an issue and i think it should be there i think if we did it in a slightly more resolution and uh, we would find that that signal is there and that would be a big threat um yeah you can you, you can you know did this approach you can measure any particular scenario into the future and you say what, what are the consequences of this this scenario into the future um developing those scenarios is a bit outside what we do and we've applied some of those scenarios in some of our work um to look at exactly those problems but yeah that shift of agriculture up the hills and competition for the cool places i think really probably the biggest threat to biodiversity um apart from climate change itself yeah no more coffee drinking <laughs> okay so i have a question i have i am environmental economics so maybe my question is very general one and we are doing environmental impacts of food systems so different items we consider as impacts of food system on the environment. But the most difficult one is 
the impact of food system on the ecosystem, which we are now thinking about how we can measure it and how we can after that have like economic value of that, right? So I, I, I did like literature review to see how we can do it. And then I came up, I mean, we came up with the idea of ecological sustainability, health condition of ecosystem, and then different items in each of them. And now you are describing that anyway, ecosystem is going to be changed, right? Like because of climate change or whatever. And now I'm just thinking that maybe ecological sustainability maybe is not a good indicator for having like impact of food system on the ecosystem condition as a general. So I'm just, my question is, is that, among those indicators that you mentioned here is connectivity that we also search for that and got like the concept of that, what's the mean? And then connectivity we have, also you mentioned biodiversity in different uh, forms, also ecological sustainability and health condition. Which one do you think it's good that we consider uh, for having environmental impact of food systems for ecosystem condition, like food system, we have food systems and then this food system impact on the environment and ecosystem. And then we want to see uh, how we can measure and then economic value of ecosystem condition caused by food system. I don't know if my question- Okay, is so I'm not actually dodging the question. Um, but I would say you need to consider all of, all, all of those things. Um, I think you know the, the, the problem is that it is actually a complicated interrelated thing. So your, your basic measure of the impact of the food system on, on the functioning of the ecosystem at the moment, and that's very much parallel to that, what the predicts meta-analysis does for land use types, but going probably to a sort of more detailed um, food system, uh, in a more integrated across, across the landscape. Um, kind of approach and getting a sense of what's what the current effects are is a prerequisite to moving to the next stage of actually thinking about what happens when it all goes crazy and you have climate change and everything starts moving around and the food system starts moving around you need to get those causal links in place um connectivity is always important um but yeah it, it, we, we there's only so many levers you have in in terms of connectivity um there are there are you know, places which are off limits they're never going to be restored and there are places which you know need to be sorted which you, which which you know, can't be can't be sorted um so yeah all of it needs to be considered and yeah suddenly anything you've been doing sounds really val valuable yeah so uh, haven't haven't just destroyed all your work <laughs> yeah thank you very much yeah, yeah. yeah um i just wanted to ask you a question um i work in non-forested systems and when you so you've got so many facets of your talk but i want to talk about the bioclimatic approach um when you look at some of the responses and changes of biomes, especially in the non-forested biomes over time, um, their responses are very counterintuitive to what you predict for climate change because of the role of rising CO2, which is often resulting in a very in the complete opposite. So grasslands are moving into um, deserts and tree covers increasing across these grass ecosystems. So how how are you factoring that in, or how should you? <laughs> so. Look, I haven't actually looked in great detail at what the um, results for, uh, you know, those kind of part forested savannah systems is. Uh, we don't have CO2 fertilization in the models. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, that side of things is just totally absent. Uh, could, could perfectly reasonably put it in, and maybe it's something they need to put in into the future. Um, in my PhD, I, I looked at heathland growth and, uh, you know, and my own conclusion was I did a very complicated way of measuring it. And I found that um, under climate change, the heathlands in, in the north of England will grow an awful lot and become an awful lot bigger. Um, and there's not actually an awful lot more to it because there are limitations on what structurally individual species can do even if you fertilize them so co2 fertilization and how much actual extra growth you actually get whether that generates you know larger things or different shaped things which then modify the environment is really important to to consider but yeah look it, it's the co2 side is missing 
I would expect the modeling approach would take into account the movement of species and the relative abundance of species because it's blind to the structural components. Um, you know, and, and if 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 you can do that space for space time substitution, that's valid. Um, then it will work. Uh, but you know, these models only account for at best you know fifty percent of the stuff that's going on in the real world. So there's uh, a whole lot of unexplained stuff. It's just part of the picture, and you know everything else needs to be taken into account at the same time. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about the application of these models, because there's a lot of talk about how they've been used in it best and so on. Um, you can produce measures from them and you can produce maps which people can use. Um, but they not, tend are people doing that? not I mean, to actually yeah. use them because economics drives land use change. And even when people start trying to consider it, you can produce the most wonderful things and you can optimize things. You can say we need to put our offsets over here, but this piece of land over here is cheaper and it's available. And um, if we use another method, we can we can ignore the information we have. So look, economics is driving stuff and it tends to get avoided. Um, we can produce, you know, produce magic numbers like one million species are committed to extinction. We don't do the, you know, 10 times that are committed to extinction if we take climate change into account number because everyone will just run 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 a, run away um and stop listening. Uh, so it's actually there's quite a fine balance about giving something which is you know, impactful, it's scary enough to um, drive action and actually dominate the ecological stuff and actually scare it, being too scary so that people just say there's no point in doing anything. So finding that line is quite important. Um, also, you know, complex models like this are a bit complicated. Um, people can choose to say it's too complicated um, and they tend to with biodiversity. Nuclear physics just believe anything those people say biodiversity models I can actually explain it to you in in, in an hour um you know nevertheless you know people people will will choose to just be cynical and 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 avoid it because you you know nuclear physics makes energy which gives you money um biodiversity doesn't make you money so um I was just thinking about the point you made about sort of patches being more valuable in degraded landscapes than in, in um, pristine landscapes. And in the context of something like BNG, where people are being incentivized, well, required to um, pay for restoration or the creation of habitats, how would you, with this idea that it's more valuable to restore landscapes, uh, restore ecosystems where it's very degraded, how would you communicate that in a way that doesn't skew things that everyone's trying to build, you know, create groves in, far, in in deserts, but rather also focus on the, the forests and expanding those and protecting those. So the issue is when you start trying to pay people money for biodiversity, as opposed to paying people money for trying, you should pay people money for trying, doing the best that they can in their location, rather than for what the consequences are for biodiversity in their location. You should value and you should have additional incentives which value the places which are in the degraded landscapes where those same actions will have more value but you have to have an equitable way of, of rewarding people for their efforts you know, if someone takes their entire um farm and makes it into a biodiversity reserve you shouldn't get more money doing that in one place than you should in another but it will have more value for biodiversity so you've got to separate those two things out and i don't know what the sort of incentive system that goes along with that looks like um but yeah you've got to be a bit careful when we're doing any of that um, and picking up on those last two points, and this may be incredibly naive, and you can tell me off and straight away, but I'm just wondering whether there's a cultural background to these two these points, and whether there's anybody who's attempted to consider, if you like, the spread and the variety of culture across the locations to attempt to identify where there may be a stronger cultural influence that would be more positive and more more proactive in thinking about the response or just have we got zero data to think like that um you're moving outside 
the area that I can reasonably comment on. But you haven't heard uh, of someone else sort of thing. Here. I'm not aware of any particular strong uh, uh, studies that have been done on that. Yes, there is a variation to cultural perceptions in of how we value nature. Um, but I, mean, I think the, the big issue I have with that is that, you know, in indigenous communities, indigenous values are based on this steady, relatively steady state environment, how you bring climate change into that, how you communicate that impact of climate change. And you know, when people start seeing that their traditional calendars are, are shifting, you know, what does that mean? Do you try and bring it back? Do you try and you know, recreate, and, you know, do you give value to that indigenous perspective because you know, those people are close to the land and they have a, have a perspective on nature that other people, you know, non-indigenous people don't in that location? Or, or do you say no? You 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 know. I mean, how how do you how do you bring in the climate change part into that conversation? It's really 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 complicated. I um I think you know those those perspectives are really important, and those those value systems are really important. And some people are you know some parts of society and some nations are, are value their their natural heritage more than others. Generally, those well, it's it, it's it's really complicated, isn't it? I mean. British people have value value their 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 semi natural systems. Yeah. If I really if highly. I continue my naive, naivety, I'm just wondering whether there's a parallel model that could be created if one were able to get hold of the data and just for the sake of it, just to try and create some sort of model to see what would come out. And it may just create an awful lot of questions. But is it conceptually possible? To I, look, I, I, I think model? it's 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 totally totally valid, and it would create an awful lot of questions. But that's all that this kind of stuff does. <laughs> <laughs> it just helps you ask the questions that you need to ask to formulate reasonable policies and uh yeah so no perfectly valid yeah. uh, yeah thank you um i was just going to ask you gave the example of peru and that was kind of an on the ground i guess system that i guess worked do you mind like talking about that a bit more and maybe how did that transition go from the work that you do to then that being in applied in a supposedly like quite successful way was that so look we just had a, a model sitting around that was fit for purpose to to link into the um the work that was going on on the ground um we were kind of not sort of end users so the the the, the development of the condition work was done you know in discussion with us so it aligned with our, our concept of condition which at the time wasn't as fully developed as the stuff i presented here still working on that arbitrary ask an expert um approach uh um but the the local people were involved the local um directorate were involved in in coming up with those uh condition services and those policy policy scenarios which we were then able to test um those were taken back to those uh policy makers and to the uh, people in the area uh the government of Peru uh, wrote in a thing which actually survived the transition of government to use these approaches for ecosystem accounting going forward and for projecting under climate change. But Peru hasn't got very much money and nobody was ever prepared to give us enough money to do the work. Um, because it involved, you know, we could run our models really easily, but it involved consultation with local people on the ground and somebody's got to pay for those. And um, I don't speak. Uh, is it Spanish or Portuguese? Spanish, I know. Mi radio este ocho tubos. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask, given how obviously well you know these models and the projected pathways, how optimistic do you feel about how things might go in the future? Um, look, I think scary stuff's going to happen. Um, it doesn't mean we're going to have complete breakdown of ecosystems um i think we're going to lose a lot of species but we've got a lot of species at the moment we probably it will might well inspire um new species to come along uh you have to think about what we actually need from nature um i think one of the big questions for me is always if you had a monoculture that provides all the function that nature provides at the moment you know large gamba grass across an entire region um is that good? Um, is that what we want? Is that better than the, the desert with a few diverse species 
coming up. Um, these are value questions. Uh, and, you know, I, I value diversity. Uh, I got this picture up because I like it. Yeah, I, I want I want the world to look like that. And this is like a uh, uh, heart of the Andes, this kind of composite picture of uh, 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 Andean meditation. But uh, yeah, look, it, it, it's, it's, it's daunting. Uh, when you start taking climate change into account because we're committed to a significant amount of climate change which means we're committed to an awful lot of extinction we've degraded a lot of land which means we're committed to extension just from that degradation of the land uh so it's a question of thinking about how we can adapt in a positive way to to make make the world a not necessarily a better place i think that the world will be a better place um but it'll be a different place um but can it be a functioning and nice place to live in um, sticking to the st scary stuff, uh, uh, when we have climate change and uh, things start to move, uh, many times we actually have uh, then disturbances that actually come in, might accelerate the move or, or even 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 hinder it. And, you know, you mentioned forest fires, yep. uh, but then also insects and diseases and so forth. Huh? How, how will that impact uh, these kind of climate change scenarios? Huh? Is you want the scary answer, you ask a scary question. And the answer is that that's not taken into account in the, this stuff. So that because it's on top of it. Yeah, yeah. So you know you get down to 50%. But then you, you can, can speculate. Knock another 20% you know. off. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, something like the forest fire stuff is, is, is really significant. I'm not sure about some of the insect stuff. I mean, pathogen, pathogens, movement of pathogens um, into new locations where there's stuff which is, is more susceptible. That's a nasty thing which sits on top of it. Migration of different species in which might uh, generate a change, that's probably taken into account in these models. And so we need to think of you know, what we mean by invasives, what, how, how invasive is an invasive? What's a viable uh, ecological migrant that's going to make for a future sustainable ecosystem when it stabilizes within the population? Uh, you know, some things are obviously bad, and some things are, are, are neutral, and it's just their context which makes them scary but yeah the fire fire is 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 on the rise mm -hmm. obviously you know when you look at satellite information it gets gets scary when you see these large black areas just like you just look around there what's because what, when you do this kind of work you have to look at look you look at satellite imagery to, to ground the truth it and it's not ground truthing it's just a visual truthing does this make sense when i look at look at the map and when you just look and look and just see black 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 as far as the eye can see mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's, that's, you know, maybe it's always been like that. And I just haven't looked at the satellite information uh, going back, but there's an awful lot of burning going on. I mean, I think the Russian stuff didn't hear very much about that, but it's a large area. Exaggerated because of the latitudinal stretching of the maps. Mm -hmm. It's not as bad as it looks because you're smaller at the top. <laughs> in mind. Okay, on, uh, on that note, uh, I think uh, that's a very good... Uh, last word to to end i remember we we did the game theoretic model where we had basically uh, a situation where you basically lost it mm -hmm. and the most rational thing you should do then is to have the last party uh, and that's exactly what we will have now <laughs> uh, we'll invite you for some drinks and uh and, and chips uh to be just finish rationally and uh uh, let's thank uh, Tom for a great talk uh, and a great discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Well.